Canon ATR72 make a touch and go on water? Apparently it can. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an ATR typewriting instructor and airline captain. And this channel is all about aviation. Today I will talk about an incredible incident that took place in Morocco two years ago. Ram Express Flight 49 was on an instrument approach to Al Husayma Airport when the airplane impacted the Mediterranean Sea and then managed to climb away safely. When a land plane lands in water, it usually comes to an abrupt stop within seconds. Before I learned about this incident, I didn't even think it would be possible for a land plane to recover from a heavy touchdown on water. The facts I am presenting in this video are from the report of the Accident Investigation Bureau of Morocco, BEA. There are some contradictions in the report, probably because it has been written by several persons. The report has also omitted several important factors such as the weather and why the pilots acted as they did. Royal Air Maroc Express or Ram Express is a regional airline owned by Royal Air Maroc Airlines. The company is based in Casablanca and operates scheduled flights to destinations in Morocco, the Canary Islands, Gibraltar, Portugal and Spain. Ram Express operates 6 ATR 72600. The airplane can carry 70 passengers. The airplane has a high wing and two turboprop engines. The landing gear is attached to the fuselage and underneath the fuselage there is a fairing that houses the landing gear, the air conditioning system, the hydraulic system and the refueling system. The ATR 72600 has a modern glass cockpit. The accident airplane is registered Charlie November Charlie Oscar Hotel and has serial number 1034, which means it's an early 600 variant without VNAV capability. It was delivered to Ram Express in 2012. The crew consisted of two pilots and two cabin crew. The captain was 61 years and had more than 13,000 hours flight time, mostly as captain and instructor on Boeing 737. He had been transferred to the ATR-72 four months before the accident and he had 193 hours on the type. The first officer was 25 years and received his CPL two years earlier. He had a total of 1063 hours, whereof 815 hours on the ATR. On 9th of July 2018, the crew was scheduled to fly four sectors. Starting in Casablanca, they fly to Al Husayma, then to Tangshir, back to Al Husayma and finally to Casablanca. They agree that the captain will be pilot flying on the first sector and he will demonstrate how to fly the approach into Al Husayma. The first officer will then fly the remaining three sectors. On the first sector from Casablanca to Al Husayma, the accident report says that crew experienced a problem with the ground proximity warning system, GPWS which is part of the Terrain Avoidance and Warning System, TOWS. It alerts the crew when they are too close to the ground. The alerts are based on information from GPS, radio altimeter, air data computer, attitude indication, flaps position and landing gear position. During cruise, a Terrain Fault Alert was issued. This alert can be triggered when the constellation on GPS satellites is less than perfect. GPS satellites are not stationary but orbit Earth two times a day. Therefore, there may be glitches in the coverage. However, after six and a half minutes, the alert disappeared and the ground proximity warning operated normally for the remainder of the flight. Al Husayma Airport has instrument approach procedures to runway 17. High terrain towards east, south and west prevents approach from the south and dictates a high approach minimum because the missed approach sector is affected by the terrain. The captain flew a GPS-based Arnav approach to runway 17. This chart is from AIP Morocco, 
AIP doesn't publish operating minimum, but obstacle clearance altitude, OCA. Here OCA is 1030 feet, which in this case is identical to the operating minimum, minimum descent altitude, MDA. The number in the bracket, 1010, is the obstacle clearance height, OCH, which is the height above the runway elevation, 20 feet. Before DME and GPS become commonplace, a non-precision approach was executed in the following way. You crossed over the final approach fix, FAF, normally a radio beacon, at the prescribed altitude. Then you descended to MDA and leveled it off. This is called a step down. Then you continue until you got the fill in sight and could land, or you made a missed approach when you reached a missed approach point. Some approaches require several step downs, and if the crew lost situation awareness, there was a risk of controlled flight into terrain, or CFIT. From 1984 to 1997, a total of 57% or CFIT accidents during approach happen during step-down approaches. To counteract this trend, a new approach concept was introduced. It has many names. It can be called constant angle non-precision approach, or constant descent approach, or constant descent angle approach, or continuous descent final approach, or constant descent final approach. Regardless of the name, they all describe the same, a continuous descent from final approach fix to 50 feet above the runway threshold. In order to respect MDA, we must add 30 feet to MDA to allow for the altitude loss when we initiate the missed approach. Some companies add 50 feet. That altitude is called the visual descent point, VDP and we treat it like decision altitude on an ILS approach. If we are not visual at VDP, we must go around. This procedure, together with the stabilized approach concept, has dramatically improved aviation safety. To help the pilots to fly a constant descent final approach, the approach charts provide two means of guidance. On this table, we can see which rate of descent we need for the current ground speed. For example, if the ground speed is 130 knots, we need a vertical rate of descent of 690 feet per minute. And here we can read distance versus altitude. On a normal 3 degree profile, you descend 320 feet per nautical mile. For example, when we are 4 miles from the runway, we should be at 1350 feet. However, when the crew descended through MDA, the captain didn't see the runway and decided to descend further down. He used a rate of descent of 1500 feet per minute. When they reached 60 feet above the sea, they were 1760 meters from the runway threshold. Shortly before that, the ground proximity warning system triggered the following alert. Terrain. Pull up. Pull up. But the captain climbed to just 100 feet, which he maintained until he landed on the runway. This is terrible. First of all, the captain deliberately descended below MDA without visual references. Secondly, he continued to descend with a high vertical rate of descent until he leveled off at 60 feet. Third, he did not react to the ground proximity warning alert. And this approach was a demonstration for the first officer. What this captain demonstrated was how not to do an approach. Nothing special happened on the second sector to Tangshir. During preparations for the third sector, the pilots did agree about the following. They will switch off the ground proximity warning during descent to avoid nuisance alarm during approach. However, the GPWS had operated as it should during the first approach, and there was no reason to switch it off. They will also prepare for a VOR approach with a minimum of 760 feet, 
That was a correct decision. They agreed that if the runway is not in view at the minima, the first officer would descend to 400 feet. In other words, they agreed to break the rules. And they agreed if the runway is not in sight at 2 nautical miles, they will go around. Of course, the missed approach point is at 2 DME. The airplane took off from Tangshia with 54 passengers, and after a short cruise, they started their descent towards Al Husayma Airport. During the descent, the captain recalled the maneuvers to be executed in the event of a go around and tells the first officer that during the approach, he, the captain, will take care of speed and water monitoring, and he, the first officer, will be piloting. What? Water monitoring? Here is how the ATR flight crew operating manual describes how to execute a non-precision approach. First, reduce the speed to 170 knots. Four nautical miles before final approach fix, select flap 15. Lower the landing gear and then select flap 30. Set the Goron altitude. Initiate the descent 0 0.3 nautical miles before final approach fix. The airplane needs that time to react and start descending. Do the before landing checklist. Check that you stabilized at 1000 feet above the runway. If you are not visual at minimum, go around. Otherwise, you may land. The accident report did not inform about the weight of the aircraft, but the approach speed and the go around speed were mentioned. Based on this, I estimate that the weight was around 20.8 tons, and this gives the following speeds. Approach speed flaps 30, 106 knots. Go around speed flap 15, 119 knots. Minimum speed flap 0, 135 knots. Those speeds are absolute minimum for a safe flight. And a little reminder, you are allowed to use Arnau when you are flying a VOR DM approach, as long as you can confirm that you are inside the approach parameters with the primary sources, which are the VOR and the DME. In real life, we don't level off before final approach fix, but fly a continuous descent from top of descent and start to configure the aircraft when we are about 2,000 feet above the runway. This is how we do it. Before reaching final approach fix and 2,000 feet above the runway, reduce the speed to 170 knots and set altitude select to go around altitude. At 2,000 feet, select flap 15. At 1800 feet and 160 knots, select gear down. At 1500 feet and 140 knots, select flaps 30. Do the before landing checklist. During the approach, adjust vertical speed, VS mode, to stay on the profile. When passing 1000 feet above the runway, check that you stabilized. And this is what it should look like on the primary flight display when you're stabilized. The aircraft is on correct flight path, the lateral deviation bar is centered, the vertical deviation bar is centered, the speed is not greater than VRF plus 20, but not less than VRF, vertical speed, VS mode, is not more than 1000 feet per minute, MDA is set to VDP, which is 760 plus 30 feet. Furthermore, on the multifunction control display unit, MCDU, there is a VINA page that shows which rate of descent you shall have. It's called TGTVS. And your deviation from the vertical profile, VDEV. Later variants of the 600, standard 2 software and upwards, also have a VINA mode that allows the autopilot to follow the vertical profile similar to an ILS glide slope. But the accident aircraft was an early variant and I used the VS mode for descent. Continue the approach. If you are not visual at the visual descent point, VDP, you go around. You activate the go around mode, add power and pitch the nose up to 8 degrees, select flap 15, add positive climb, select gear up, and activate IAS mode, indicated airspeed. 
follow the missed approach track, etc., etc. Now, let's see how the crew on flight 49 did perform. The green line is the approach profile. The dark red line is the actual track. They passed over final approach fix a bit too fast and a bit too high, but it was still recoverable. But from now on, they did almost everything wrong. Altitude select was set to 400, but the procedure requires you to set the governor altitude, in this case 3000 feet. The accident report doesn't mention whether I used the MDA, which should have been set to 790 feet. And when they reach MDA, they will get an automatic call that they reached the minimum. But that is not mentioned. Flap 15 was selected at 1800 feet, and at 1300 feet, the landing gear was selected down. Shortly after, VS mode vertical speed mode was set to minus 1800 feet per minute. At 1000 feet above the runway, they were not stabilized, neither did they check it. They were not in landing configuration, they were 240 feet below the profile, and the rate of descent exceeded 1000 feet per minute. At 800 feet, flaps 30 was set. Shortly after, Alt Star mode was activated, commanding the aircraft to level off at 400 feet. The first officer set altitude select mode to 9400 feet. The captain announced, keep on going. The speed dropped to 106 knots before it was increased again. VS mode was engaged with minus 1000 feet per minute. When passing 310 feet, the first officer set VS mode to minus 1800 feet per minute. At 135 feet, VS mode was set to minus 1400 feet per minute. And the first officer said, it's not normal. At 80 feet, the first officer disengaged the autopilot and started to pull the nose up. At the same time, the captain started to push the control column forward. At 35 feet, the first officer applied go around power, but they didn't call go around. Both pilots were struggling with the control column when the airplane hit the water two times with a nosedome attitude and a force of 3.9 G. The captain then released his pressure on the control wheel and surprisingly, the aircraft started to climb. But it wasn't over yet. Shortly after they started to climb, the captain made another critical error. He selected the flaps up from 30 degrees to zero. He should have selected 15 degrees. At the same time, the speed dropped to 105 knots because they were climbing very steeply. The only thing that prevented the aircraft from stalling was that the flaps needed 14 seconds to retract. During that period, the speed increased again. Shortly after, the landing gear was retracted. At 500 feet, the speed was 180 knots, which is close to the go around speed with flap 15. However, the flaps was fully retracted and the speed should have been at least 135 knots. Oddly enough, the accident report states that the stick shaker was not activated. When the air traffic controller asked for the reason for the missed approach, the captain said that they had a bird strike. After landing at the alternate airport, the captain reported to the company that they had a bird strike. Later, he had to admit that they had hit the water. Thankfully, there were no injuries to packs and crew. A visual inspection of the aircraft found damage to the forward part of the underbelly. That means it's here the forward part here. The one panel and two stringers are damaged. Furthermore, the landing gear had to be replaced 
because the impact force had exceeded the structure limit. Surprisingly, there were no other damages to the aircraft. The accident report has the following conclusion. The event occurred due to non-compliance with the operational procedures, in particular the deliberate shutdown of the ground proximity warning system, and the continuation of the unstable approach below the stabilization floor, and the continuation of the approach below the minimum descent altitude, MDA, in the absence of visual references. The accident report has a lot of focus on why the ground proximity warning system was off. However, during the first approach, the captain neglected the alert from the ground proximity warning system. The crew considered the alarm to be false, but it wasn't. Therefore, would it make any difference if the ground proximity warning system had been active? No, I don't think so. If the ground proximity warning system had been operational during the accident flight, they probably would have reacted as they did during the first approach, by doing nothing. Therefore, I find it more correct to rephrase the first point of the conclusion to read, the event occurred due to non-compliance with operational procedures, in particular, the deliberate decision to descend below MDA. The accident report leaves many questions unanswered. Here are five of them. 1. Why did the captain decide to descend below minimum? 2. Why did the first officer agree to break the rules? 3. Why didn't the crew fly a stabilized approach? 4. Why didn't the crew see the sea until the last moment? 5. Why did the captain push the control wheel forwards? Let's start with the first question. Why did the captain decide to descend below minima? My theory is that the captain knew that the approach was over the sea and free of obstacles. This may have led him to find it acceptable to descend below minima. But the captain's decision also tells us that he put himself above the rules. And this is a very dangerous attitude. We should never give away our safety margins. Number two, why did the first officer agree to break the rules? This crew consisted of an experienced captain and an inexperienced first officer. Very often this creates a steep gradient of authority and the first officer will find it difficult to speak against the captain. This puts a lot of responsibility on the captain who has to create an environment in the cockpit that encourages the first officer to speak out when necessary. After all, we are two pilots and we are a team. Number three, why didn't the crew fly stabilized approach? Apparently, that was not in their mind. The focus of the pilots was to descend below the clouds, become visual and then land. Such a dive and drive procedure without a defined minimum is very dangerous because you throw your safety margins overboard. On this flight, none of the criteria for stabilized approach written in the company's operational manual were met. Not a single one of them. Was the aircraft on the correct flight path? No, they were 240 feet too low. Were only small changes in pitch or heading necessary? No, they would need a large change in pitch to recover. Was the speed not greater than VRF plus 20? No, it was 45 knots too high. Was the airplane in correct landing configuration? No, they had only flap 15. Was the rate of descent not more than 1000 feet per minute? No. It was 1800. Was the power setting suitable for the configuration? No, they had no speed control. Were all briefings and checklists completed? No, they never did a before landing checklist. The last line is only relevant for ILS and circling approach. To sum it up, they had seven out of seven reasons to go around but I didn't do it.
Number four, why didn't they cruise in the sea until the last moment? I know the answer to this one, sea fog. Let me explain. Al Husayma airport is close to the Mediterranean Sea. In July, the average temperature in the water is 22 degrees Celsius. The latest weather report given to the crew was wind calm, visibility 4000 meters in mist, overcast clouds at 600 feet, temperature and dew point 23 degrees Celsius, QNH 1016 hectopascal, that's air pressure. Dew point is the temperature the air has to be cooled to to reach 100% relative humidity. This causes formation of clouds and fog. Here's an example to compare. When the dew point is 10 degrees less than the temperature, the relative humidity is 50%. As long as the temperatures are given without decimals, 23 degrees can mean anything from 22.5 to 23.4 degrees. And the relative humidity can be anything from 95 to 100%. That makes a big difference. On this day, it was cloudy and misty. When an observer determines the visibility, he or she looks for landmarks with a known distance from his or her position. However, it would be impossible to determine the visibility over the sea because there are no landmarks out there. The pilots expected to be visible below 600 feet and see the runway from a distance of 4,000 meters. But when they learned that both temperature and dew point were 23 degrees, they should have expected different conditions over the sea. The humidity comes from the sea, and therefore the relative humidity over the sea is higher than over land. And when the air is calm, the air cannot mix, but remains stable. This is a receipt for sea fog. I have flown in Norway for three decades and have experienced this weather phenomena many times. The sea fog has resulted in missed approaches, deviation and cancelled flights. That's part of life. Number five, why did the captain push the control column forwards just before impact? This is another mystery. The first officer had started to pull up when the captain intervened and forced the nose down. It may have been caused by vertical or another sensory illusion. Our senses can play games with us, causing us to act in a way that we otherwise would find unbelievably stupid. When the accident report for Atlas Air Flight 3591 was published this July, we learned that the go around mode was accidentally activated during descent. The first officer experienced spatial disorientation and pushed the nose into a dive, from which the crew was not able to recover. Shortly after, the captain made another serious mistake when he retracted the flaps from 30 to 0 degrees when the airplane started to climb. It's evident that he had lost situation awareness and had little idea about what he was doing. The accident report didn't address this either. And as this was not enough, he lied when he was asked about what had happened. This accident clearly demonstrates how one bad pilot can put many lives at stake. The accident reports are full of them. Therefore, if you experience any wrongdoings from your colleague, you have to stand up and say, no, that is not okay. And that is all for this time. I hope you have learned something. And please leave comments below. Please support this channel by clicking like, subscribe and share with your friends. Thank you for watching and happy learning.